Also, if you don't like the speaker, contact him. He'll see what he can do about it. My uh, talk today is on diagnostic cytology. Uh, what I hope to do is uh, give you a little idea of what can be done with cytology, uh, my approach to it. At the University of Georgia, the clinical pathologists, most of us are trained in anatomic pathology as well, and in our diagnostic surgical path service, uh, the same person reads the cytologies that reads the biopsies. This gives us some quality control uh, on our diagnoses, although I consider it unethical to wait till I get the histopath before I make the uh, cytologic diagnosis. <laughs> also, it makes you more conservative uh, in your diagnoses, I guess, or more liberal one, uh, whichever way you want to look at it. First, I'd like to talk about effusions because uh, examination of body fluids is a rather high yield cytologic procedure. Just to review your physiology, and we've all had this, uh, we classify effusions uh, and eventually by their mechanism or the cause. We have the changes in pressure that can uh, increase the amount of fluid that leaves the capillary and retained in the tissues, uh, increased hydrostatic pressure, we think of cardiac disease or even local obstruction of blood vessels can increase the hydrostatic pressure. Uh, colloidal osmotic pressure tends to draw fluid from the tissues back into the bloodstream. It's the main uh, physiological component doing this. And anything that reduces plasma protein level will decrease plasma colloidal osmotic pressure and potentially can lead to an effusion or edema. Uh, inflammation uh, is a major cause of effusions uh, due to increased capillary permeability, although other things may take place as well. Uh, increased tissue colloidal osmotic pressure, sometimes this is not listed, but it does increase any time we have a lot of protein uh, in the tissues, it can occur with uh, inflammation. It can occur with lymphatic obstruction as the protein in the tissues, which is usually removed by lymphatic drainage, uh, lymphatic obstruction can uh, lead to increased tissue colloidal osmotic pressure. It also can retain some of the fluid that is drained away by lymphatics. So with these in mind, uh, we'll take a look at uh, body cavity effusions. Now, there are only a limited number of cells that you expect to see normally. As you know, the body cavity is aligned by a mesothelium or a serosal type surface. This is a scraping of a normal mesothelium and it will come off in a sheet, uh, sort of a tile-like appearance. Now, these are unstimulated or resting types of mesothelial cells. Uh, mesothelial cells tend to have a fringe on them if the drying of the smear is slow, which uh, uh, that's a nice thing to have. Uh, it helps you identify it as a mesothelial cell. Anytime there is fluid in a cavity in excess, particularly if it has a, a protein in it to a degree, this makes a good culture media for the proliferation of mesothelial cells. And they will hypertrophy and undergo hyperplasia. And we can refer to these as basophilic mesothelial cells or more basophilic. Uh, reactive mesothelial cell is a term that is used. They may divide, they may be binucleated. And again, this picture of the Fringe is a drying artifact. These are processes of mesothelial cells. I've always thought this would make a, I could exhibit this in the, one of the art museums and make, a, make an interesting picture and probably would draw some comments, but cytologists have a perverted uh, interest in things. 
We've said they can divide. Uh, you can see mitoses, and they can be multinucleated. With time, they may lose some of the typical characteristics and become more macrophage-like. And it's probably a mute point to try to differentiate these mesothelial cells. I think these uh, three are mesothelial cells. These, I could say, are monocyte or rather inactive uh, macrophages. They're indented, but they may have been mesothelial cell derived. Uh, as you know, most of the macrophages are blood monocyte derived, but a certain number that we do see in effusions, I think, probably came from probably come from mesothelial cells. The mesothelial cell is phagocytic to a degree, and so the finding of particulate matter in a mesothelial cell doesn't uh, eliminate it from that category and put it in the macrophage group. Uh, we can have phagocytosis in both. But these, uh, this would just illustrate that point. Mesothelial cells can cluster. Uh, this probably is a uh, is not a result of division, but probably the result of aggregation after they've desquamated. We might uh, also show a macrophage showing some reactivity, uh, neutrophils and the lymphocyte. Lymphocytes are not real common in effusions, as you would expect, since they're not a, really a modal cell. Most of the cells we see migrate uh, from the blood, through the tissues, and into the cavity. This is an example of then the other cells that we see, the neutrophil and the macrophage. These are rather active macrophages. This one is phagocytized, uh, probably some cellular debris, and there's an erythrocyte uh, in the cytoplasm. Now, normally, we expect probably to have neutrophils predominate in effusions, that's what ex is expected. And uh, there will be a certain number of macrophages. You may or may not see mesothelial cells. In any smear of an effusion, you would expect the bigger cells to be at the feathered end of the smear, and that is where you'll usually find your reactive mesothelial cells. The I might as well mention it while we're at this, at this slide. These neutrophils are uh, healthy looking neutrophils, they may be uh, more segmented, tend, tend towards hypersegmentation as their age, and since uh, the cavity, the fluid in the cavity is, uh, does contain the older neutrophils, you ex expect to see more lobes to the nuclei. And we talk about in cytology de degenerate and non-degenerate neutrophils. And that, the only reason we make that distinction is to give us some indication of the possibility of sepsis. Uh, normally, we expect them to be non-degenerate. Now, when we say that, we're talking about nuclear changes. When, we, when you say degenerate neutrophil, you're talking about one whose nucleus is swollen and more eosinophilic. That's in contrast to the term the hematologist uses of toxic neutrophil, when we look, are looking at peripheral blood, we examine the cytoplasm of neutrophils, and if it's blue and vacuolate, we say they're toxic, and that's a change that takes place in the bone marrow. Now, we're not uh, talking about that abnormality. We're talking about a nuclear abnormality when we say degenerate neutrophils, and the abnormality takes place at the site of the inflammation. Uh, just another e example of non-degenerate neutrophils, even though by blood standards they look toxic, uh, their cytoplasm is rather foamy, uh, this uh, is not abnormal for a tissue or a fusion location. So those are what we expect normally uh, in fluids. Now we do a limited amount of serum or chemistry on effusions. You can do anything on an effusion that you would do on blood. But from a diagnostic standpoint, the protein is rather routine. Uh, we do refractometry protein if our fluid is clear. If we cannot clear it on centrifugation, then we may use some other method. Uh, you'll read uh, specific gravity done on fluids. I really don't 
see much need to do specific gravity if you have a protein that basically are telling you the same thing. One thing I might caution you about is with in using the refractometer that's calibrated for urine, the specific gravity you see in the refractometer used for urine is not true specific gravity. That's urine specific gravity. Uh, and it, it'll not do for specific gravity for other things. Now the protein will. Now there are a few other things that are done occasionally. Uh, BUN creatinine might be used to determine if the effusion due, is due to ruptured urinary bladder. Creatinine is preferred over BUN because it takes longer, longer for creatinine to equilibrate with the body fluids than urea. The urea equilibrates uh, rather rapidly. And if you had a ruptured bladder, the rent repaired, and uh, initially you would have a BUN in the fluid much higher than that in the blood. But with time, the, it would equilibrate, uh, reach an equilibrium, and you would, had, would have a high BUN in both places. Now, conversely, if you have an azotemia for any cause other than uh, ruptured urinary bladder, you'd expect a high uh, serum urea, and with time, you would have a high fluid urea as well. So uh, with any of these others, you need to compare the fluid level with the serum level. One by itself doesn't prove anything. Any azotemic animal is going to have an elevated BUN creatinine in the fluid. Any ictric animal is going to have a high bilirubin in, the, in a fusion fluid. And the same with, with other uh, parameters. So you need a ratio and you need to have a low ratio because of the fluid level of any of these being higher than the blood. Uh, ruptured your, uh, trauma to the liver, ruptured gallbladder, this type of thing might lead to high, uh, be diagnosed by comparing bilirubin. Uh, chylothorax, uh, chyloabdomen, uh, triglyceride probably is the preferred method, but again, it needs to be compared. And occasionally we'll use amylase for pancreatitis, although that uh, probably is not as good a method, as good a diagnostic tool as it sounds. So, but for the most part, the information we gain from effusions is gained by cytologic examination. Now let's look at the types of, of things that might exist uh, with effusions. We can have a pure transudate, um, I've sort of gone the cycle. I was taught in veterinary school that there was a straight line between transudates and exudates, and it, it was uh, definite. Uh, less, le less than 500 cells, protein less than 2,5 means transudate. If it's 2,6, it's an exudate. Uh, that uh, is, of course, not true, but uh, we'll, we'll live with that. I've sort of gone back to it a little bit because students don't like gray. Again, we expect the normal cells. We've talked about neutrophils predominating of some macrophages and mesothelial cells. And the types of things that give us the pure transudate, but there are about two things. One is hypoproteinemia, more specifically hypoalbuminemia. Uh, and another thing is, is portal hypertension, which uh, can result in sodium retention. And the two things together lead to ascites uh, by, them, by itself. Uh, uh, portal hypertension will not do it, but there is, uh, we know, and not completely sure the reason that sodium retention occurs. And this would be primarily uh, what is called pre-sinusoidal uh, hypertension of the liver. The lesions probably in the triads, it's usually fibrosis, and it occurs, uh, it backs up the uh, portal uh, blood flow to the liver before we've added the albumin and other proteins that we synthesize in the liver. If we have post-sinusoidal hypertension, which would be back no, more in the central vein, vein area uh, and might have a cause even centrally in the heart, uh, the fluid is, is more, is a high protein. So portal hypertension due to 
presynosoidal lesion uh, can give us a pure transudate. Now let's look at a couple of cases, uh, and I'll give a rather limited amount of data. Here we have uh, a dog with a CITES uh, pointer, and when we see this combination in Georgia, you say uh, am renal amyloidosis, because the pointer is a common breed in that disease. But we have a colorless clear fluid, which you see in a transudate, because there's not enough cells to give it any turbidity or color, and we have uh, less than our we're in the range of pure transudate. Uh, so our differential, is it, is it liver disease or is it uh, hypoproteinemia? And we determined that by serum protein level. This case had a very low serum albumin. It was a renal amyloidosis. And we would, have to we would not differentiate it on the fluid, but the specific cause, but we would have to rule out other causes of hypoproteinemia. And they may even be liver disease and portal hypertension. So we would, that would be a, a separation we'd have to make. Uh, renal disease, liver disease, malabsorption, protein losing enteropathy, uh, those uh, loss of protein and exudate, superficial particular, those things would help us in our differential. The cytology is not impressive, it's normal. And that, so we're not going to see any difference between uh, the pure transudate in the normal animal. Now this, this example, this Doberman uh, had a CITES as well, somewhat similar. The protein value was a little bit higher, and we say less than two because the refractometer quits reading it too. Uh, we could, uh, if we use another methods, we could give a precise protein uh, level. Usually in hypoproteinemia, you don't start getting edema or ascites until your albumin levels in the serum are below one gram per deciliter. Now this one's a little higher than you probably expect with uh, pure hypoproteinemia, and you start thinking uh, when it's at the marginal level, it might, we might have uh, chronic hepatic disease and portal hypertension with sodium retention. Now. As you're aware, this, the things that cause uh, portal hypertension with time may reduce the functional mass of the liver sufficient to cause hypoalbuminemia. So we may have both things uh, in play, portal hypertension and hypoalbuminemia in chronic hepatic disease. Now, uh, this is the reason you have grade twos and a three grade point grading system and the reason we couldn't live with transudate and exudates. Not everything fits real nicely. So, and this is probably a veterinary term and uh, I don't know whether everybody would understand it, but this term was put in to include that group of effusions where it did not fit the transudate category in either cell count or protein level, so we may have an increased number of cells, we may have an increased protein, and, and we may have a slight increase in both. And you say, well, why don't you just call it an exudate? And that may be what we should do, but the basic mechanism in these diseases that we tend to classify in veterinary medicine as modified transudate, the mechanism is not increased capillary permeability, Rather, it is one of these pressure changes that are usually not a part, always a part of inflammation. Uh, as long as you understand uh, what we're talking about, and I, ha I would have no problem calling uh, this category non-septic mild inflammation. The cells can vary. Uh, we can have normal cytology, or we, in certain cases, uh, lymphocytes might be added if there's lymphatic uh, leakage. Now this is one of those cases. Uh, cell count slightly increased. I had one uh, two days ago uh, when I was on duty. A rather high protein level for the number of cells. And they would say this is a modified transudate modified with uh, excess protein. Uh, this is a cardiac disease. Cytology was not remarkable, looked normal. Uh, the key is low low uh, cells, high protein. Now low cells, high protein can mean a variety of things in different species. <clears throat> in the dog, it, uh, you think cardiac disease, a modified transudate. 
In the cat, you think uh, FIP, feline infectious peritonitis, because even though it's an inflammation, it's low cell, uh, high protein. In the horse, anterior enteritis uh, is characterized by low cell, high protein. So there, there are uh, both inflammatory type situations as well as what we'll call uh, transudative type situations that may lead to uh, this pattern. Cytologically, uh, neutrophils, macrophages, and mesothelial cells. I would like to have a stamp uh, where I could just stamp that on my reports and would not have to write that out. Now the exudate, uh, we've got our definition of it. And some of the things that I'll put in the exudate category, uh, I vary on what year I'm teaching on whether I put them in exudate or modified transudate. But we have a number of things that make, uh, other than bacteria or infectious agents, that may cause inflammation. And we'll uh, look at some of these. Here we have a cat, an older cat. Uh, the key things are it has whitish, turbid fluid, uh, uh, an increase in cells that did get over 5,000, and it had a slightly elevated protein. Now, this could uh, fit in the modified transudate category, and sometimes I put it there. But once you get past modified transudate into a definite etiology, it doesn't matter what you classify it as. Our purpose for classification is get is so that we can get to the mechanism of the particular effusion. A uh, whitest effusion is, we, we think of uh, chylus. So anytime we have a whitish effusion, we've got, it's either chylus or it looks like it's chylus and it's not. And we can determine that as pseudochylus. So we don't know that at this stage. Now, I might talk about how we differentiate or how we diagnose the chylus effusion, which can either be in the thorax or the abdomen, much more common in a thoracic effusion. It is whitish and turbid. Cytologically, the small lymphocyte will predominate. When we have lymphocytes predominating in fluids, we think we've got really three things to think about uh, in, in the animals that I deal with. We've got chylothorax. We've got feline cardiac disease can give us a lymphocytic effusion, which may be chylus or non-chylus, and lymphosarcoma. And we separate the first two from the lymphosarcoma by them being the small mature lymphocyte. Now with time, the lymphocyte population may be reduced and neutrophils may come in. And probably what we're having is inflammation. I read somewhere where the, we very seldom have it turn into a septic inflammation because of the lipids somewhat bacteriostatic or cidal. But if you drain it off repeatedly, you'll eventually deplete the animal of its lymphocytes, uh, the equivalent of draining the thoracic duct. You'll be lymphopenic, and the fluids will not have many lymphocytes. Neutrophils may predominate. So it may vary. Either case, uh, there is example of triglyceride. Uh, we can do that by sedanophilic staining, uh, more specifically by comparing the serum and the fluid triglyceride. Now, the books will tell you this, and I'd hate, uh, I would put it in the books, but it's not used that much. It's supposed to clear with ether. Well, I've had some that would not clear. Uh, it should not clear with sodium hydroxide. Now, sodium hydroxide will clear some of the non chylus whitish effusions, which are due to cellular debris. Sodium hydroxide would, would tend to dissolve and disperse some of that. The main thing we're talking about is lymphocytes and uh, evidence of increased triglyceride. And that previous case you had uh, did show this. It was a case of uh, a chylus effusion. Now, in the cat, in the cat, a chylus effusion may be due to trauma or an actual rupture of the duct, or it may be due to some increase in pressure and uh, 
loss of lymphocytes. Now, I, have, I don't know if this has been proven and everybody has their idea of where the source of these lymphocytes are. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Prosty, thinks they come from the, uh, bronch the lymphocytes in the lung, the BALT uh, group, saying that the thoracic duct should not be very permeable to diapodesis, but uh, that, that's more of a, a theory. I don't know if we've definitely proven the source of the lymphocytes in feline cardiac disease, whether there's triglyceride with them or not. So the point I want to make is uh, I've seen feline cardiac disease that had a whitish fluid with lymphocytes with triglyceride and without triglyceride elevations. And uh, I picked the one slide we have where the right stain shows some uh, lipid. <laughs> Usually you'll not see this. You'll have to rely upon... Uh, sedan staining to demonstrate lipid. Occasionally, you'll see macrophages that are very foamy and vacuolated, and the sedan stain will stain this very brightly. And uh, this is the type thing we're looking for, sedanophilic droplets. Although the sedan stain is terrible to work with because the, the stain precipitates out, you have to filter it immediately before use or you'll get a lot of uh, artifacts. Now, the pseudochylus effusion uh, is a whitish, whitish effusion that uh, can have any types of cell, but it does not have evidence of the triglyceride. Uh, feline cardiac disease uh, can be pseudochylus, and I don't know whether that's a good term, uh, and some people would like to drop pseudochylus, but a, limp, a white quite a suffusion that could be due to small lymphocytes. Lymphosarcoma sometimes appears whitish, the fluid. It may, it may not, but uh, in any event, the lymphosarcoma effusions are characterized by large immature lymphocytes, and as you know, the characteristics of immaturity, if that's a good term, in the lymphocyte is a large cell, dispersed chromatin, nucleoli, and a and usually abundant blue cytoplasm. In cytology, if you've, if you've never looked at cytological specimens, your first problem will be learning to ignore lysed cells. These are all cells that are taking on water. Uh, they still have cytoplasm, but their nucleus, as you can see how it compares with the other cells. Now this, may be, this is probably a result of trauma of the aspiration or trauma of making the smear, and we're going to have a certain number of them in any effusion. And we may see nice big blue nucleoli in the cell that is undergoing lysis where the nucleolus was not visible in the intact uh, viable appearing cells. Another example of uh, a lymphomatous effusion. Neoplasia, let's uh, talk about that. And neoplasia could be put in either the modified transudate category sometimes or the non-septic inflammation. It doesn't really matter. Once you see you have neoplastic cells, then it's a, it's a tumorous effusion and you don't care whether it's modified transudate or exudative. And you look for clusters of cells. Now clusters of cells uh, to the cytologist uh, in effusions uh, put him in a panic because Mesothelial cells cluster as well as tumor cells. And I think the more you look at them and the more you get burned, the more conservative you get and you're not sure you can even tell the difference unless the cell fills the entire field, microscopic field. I'll, I'll show you some things and uh, act like it's easy. Uh, if you think it's easy, then you're not very experienced in cytology. <laughs> You'll tend to, I think cytology is like anything else, and I found out in my career when I switched from being an anatomic pathologist to a clinical pathologist, I thought I knew the blood cells good. 
uh, and had them in good categories, and then I got real confident, and then my confidence dropped to a low ebb even before I le leveled before I started, and then it slowly went back up, and I think that's sort of the way we do. We say it's real easy when we've only seen two cases, and it was real easy to tell those two apart, but when that third case doesn't uh, fit the first or the second, it's in the middle, uh, then we start getting uh, more and more categories. Well, mesothelial cells, when they cluster, uh, this is a mesothelial, mesothelial cell cluster, and this area here is not an aston or lumen, but probably a trapped uh, air bubble, so they, it can be difficult. Uh, and so there are a number of things to look for, and I'll probably take this part of my talk to talk about uh, diagnosing malignancy. But you notice that one thing that tips you off that this is a rather benign situation is that all the nuclei are pretty much the same size. Now contrast that to a cell cluster from a, carcin a mammary carcinoma that it desquamated uh, into a cavity. We have one large nucleus here and then some other uh, smaller <coughs> nuclei. And it's much more basophilic and uh, but the problem is, it's pretty dark. Now, my experience as a cytologist has been uh, with the right stain. Uh, people that really got veterinary med medical cytology going, Dr. Perman's one of the pioneers in it, uh, and he, he worked pretty much with right stain, although he liked new methylene blue stain. And if we have Minnesota people in the, in the group, they probably got blue under their fingernails. But uh, we're, we're used to uh, blood smears, and we teach veterinary students that are going to practice, and we want to give them something that they can use in a practice situation, so we tend to teach right stain morphology. And in veterinary medicine, probably the neoplasia in, in our cytological service is not the predominant thing we deal with. So my experience is with the right stain. The trouble with the right stain is it's not a good chromatin stain. So as we'll see, uh, we're at a disadvantage in, in our determination of malignancy and therefore a little bit of disadvantage in separating some normal cells from malignant, malignant or tumor cells. Well, the general criteria for malignancy that uh, you see, which can, most of them can be done with right stain, large cells, aggregates, and we're talking primarily about carcinoma. It'll be the same cell line, so we're pretty sure that, that these cells are the same cell, but there is also polymorphism involved, the variation in size of these, this, these cells, as well as variation in shape. And th these determinations are not specific. You could, I could say the same thing for mesothelial cells, maybe, except the polymorphism might not uh, be as evident. And these, this can be done with right stain. The nuclear criteria are our best uh, indication. And some of these can be done with the right stain. The nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio can easily be determined, and we expect to see really big nuclei. Uh, this is a nice word in a description. Uh, Nisocaryosis. If you can go home and tell your wife you saw a nisocaryosis today, she's impressed. Uh, multinucleation can be uh, observed with the right stain. Uh, mitoses, and even nuclear molding, and I'll try to show you some of these. Now, when you start getting to nucleolar abnormalities, uh, membrane abnormalities, and abnormalities in chromatin, uh, then it would be good for us to do the papaniculi stain, or stain that is specific for the nucleus and doesn't stain the cytoplasm. And this allows us, uh, the pap stain allows us to look at clusters of cells that would be nothing but a big blue blob with the right stain. But this stain requires more reagents. If you've got to set up with your alcohol, various uh, concentrations of alcohol, and it is a little more difficult in that respect in the lab. It's also, for the papaniculi stain, you have to have a wet fix preparation, and that's very difficult to get uh, clinicians to do. 
cytoplasmic criteria are really not very specific for malignancy. Any of these things that we say here you could have in reactive cells. So we really don't make a diagnosis of malignancy with the cytoplasm. We may determine the cell type and the cell, the degree of differentiation. The cytoplasm reflects the differentiation of the cell uh, rather than its uh, the state of malignancy. Okay, this is uh, so that another cluster from the same mammary adenocarcinoma, and you'll notice our nuclei are too dark to do too much with. We don't see, can't make out much on chromatin pattern, but we can, we do see the nucleus to cytoplasmic ratio uh, is very high. We can see that there is uh, uh, an esokaryosis. Uh, nuclear molding uh, is, is almost too dark to uh, tell much on that. I can show you that in another slide. This one didn't read the book uh, on uh, another point I'll make. Usually carcinomas, the cells that, in a carcinoma, the cells that are shed together as a cell uh, fragment. Whereas in mesothelial cell clusters and say clusters of macrophages, they tend to aggregate after they're in the cavity. And when they aggregate after they're in the cavity, you tend to get more of this looping effect on the margin. Uh, well, this carcinoma didn't read that part. That's the trouble with these criteria. They are present in uh, a variety of cells. Now, again, there, here is an example of uh, probably a neoplastic cluster. We've got an esokaryosis, and it is rather smooth around here until we get to this loop. Now, this very well could be a mesothelial cell that's stuck on to this cluster of carcinoma. Uh, there is some differences. I have no problem here. You, this, uh, we could train the chimpanzee to diagnose this as carcinoma. It has, it's a cluster that's smooth on the outside, like maybe it fragmented that way. There's nuclear molding, a very real prominent nucleolus, and the right stain uh, and the dry, uh, air dried preps, the nucleoli are never real sharp. And so we, we are not able to make fine evaluation of nucleolus, but we can tell whether it's enlarged in the number of them. Uh, but this, this one has a lot of the characteristics of malignancy. But again, you see what the right stain does. Uh, it overstains uh, cells. This is a squamous carcinoma in fluid. Uh, there are a lot of neutrophils, so there's an inflammation as well. Uh, some vacuolations that can be a degenerative changes. The squamous cells are so much bigger than any other cell, you don't have much problem. And this doesn't uh, look like uh, a normal squamous cell. So squamous carcinomas are a little easier to, to diagnose. Now the pap smear, uh, you can see, we, we see the nucleus very well, the chromatin. We see the nuclear membranes very thick in certain areas, like right here and not there's some variation in the staining of the nuclear membrane, which is a sign of malignancy. We've got uh, a, very, a very disordered, uh, non-symmetrical aggregation of chromatin. So that, that, that's the value of the, of the pap smear. A nuclear molding uh, present in this one. We can... See again our thickening of the nuclear membrane, a real prominent nucleoli. Uh, the real sharp, uh, sharp margins of the chromatin is another sign of malignancy that we can see. So the pap smear would be nice to have, and we do it occasionally, but usually we, we've already looked at a right stain beforehand, and then we'll ask the clinician to go back and air dry and wet fix the prep uh, enable us to determine whether it's benign or malignant. Sometimes it's just as well to go ahead and do your histopath and look at a histologic section. So my uh, practice of cytology and, and surgical pathology, I don't do too many pap stains. If we say suspect a tumor or, or probable tumor, generally tend to be conservative in calling something malignant. 
All right, let's uh, look at some other cases. This is a, uh, we've, we've got an ectric animal, uh, we've got a trauma in the history, a yellowish green fluid, so the color is different. We need to explain that. It is uh, too high cell count to be in any of the modified transudate categories, uh, but not really markedly increased. And we did do bilirubin on the fluid, and the ratio of the effusion to the serum indicated that it was much higher in the effusion. So we suspect to make, there's leakage of, of bilirubin or bile into the cavity. And we can make some, uh, we can diagnose it uh, without the chemistry to a degree. Free bile looks yellowish. Bile that has been phagocytized by macrophage will be darker or more black in color. And when you see bl this black or bronze colored material in a macrophage, you probably have got about four choices. It could be bile, it may be hemosiderin, you've got to consider melanin, and if it's at the right location, maybe a carbon or some particulate matter, particularly in the macrophage of the lung or the lymph nodes draining that area. The, the neutrophils look pretty good here. Uh, they're non-degenerate, although uh, if there's a high concentration of bile, they may, some have gone, undergone lysis and swelling. Now these are mesothelial cells. They look sort of bad, uh, but, and there's also bile within uh, these reactive mesothelial cells indicating that they are, can be phagocytic. This case is a little more long-standing. There's not too much free bile, whereas this is an example of uh, one where maybe there's continued leaking and we have the yellowish material, but we have a macrophage full of black material. And we'll put this as a non-septic inflammation. And generally, non-septic inflammations have non-degenerate neutrophils. Now, the septic types are primarily bacterial, and I'll put FIP in the septic type, although it doesn't look septic. And we'll, we'll see that later. And it, you get uh, increased cells. The more cells you get, the more likely it is to be septic. Uh, protein levels can uh, be high. Uh, probably won't get much higher than this in septic inflammation in the five gram category or less. And when we have this high protein in the cats, uh, it may help us to determine what the makeup of the protein. Uh, if we determine an AG ratio on it, and the AG ratio indicates that albumin uh, is the major component, then we think away from FIP and think towards the more bacterial types. Whereas in FIP, globulin is a major component, and our ratio will be less. There was a recent study done that with electrophoresis of effusions with high protein, it was found out that there were, if it was ratio was greater than 0.81, uh, then it was not FIP. Just reflects uh, the nature of it. Now, generally, FIP is a low cell. This is a little high cell count, but they don't all read the book. Now, these are, these are degenerate neutrophils. Swollen, pink uh, lobes, chromocenters tend to blend together. And when you see this, and you'll see a certain amount more debris with this, uh, the debris probably is both uh, serum protein and cellular debris, you start looking for bacteria, and we have a couple of rods, intracellular rods. It'd be tough to make out bacteria uh, in this area, although with the right stain, bacteria stain blue. So it, the right stain is a good stain for bacteria. You don't have to do a gram stain to identify bacteria. You have to do the gram stain to determine whether they're gram positive or gram negative, not whether they're there or not. So if you see degenerate neutrophils, that keys you to spend a little more time searching for the bacteria. And often the cells are so degenerate, you could not tell what the cell of origin. I'll say these are degenerate neutrophils, but I don't know. They could be lymphocytes or dead uh, macrophages, although macrophages are a very resistant cell, 
and is one, will be one of the last ones to lice. The lymphocytes the most fragile and uh, are very tough to make smears that don't contain a lot of lice cells when you're dealing with a lymphocyte preparation. I might add one thing here. Cells that are uh, fluids that are poor in protein, when you make the smear, the cells are more likely to be lysed than cells rich in protein. Protein tends to stabilize the cell. Cerebrospinal fluid is a good example. If you don't add some protein to your sediment, if you're doing a sediment smear, cerebrospinal fluid, you'll look at mostly lysed cells. And I think that the degenerative change we see in cytological preparation is probably an in vitro change rather than an in vivo, at least the morphological change, because it probably takes place during, some of it, during the preparation. These cells are just more fragile, tend to be more permeable, and during the drying and the staining process will uh, take on water and uh, more readily and tend to have the chromatolysis is taking place. I'll mention one thing, uh, and that is uh, the no cardiac tenomyces type of effusion, which is common, and it bear, it's a little bit different from others in that you tend to get micro colonies, and that's what you should make the smear out of because the more fluid portion might not have the bacteria. Most of the bacteria tends to stay closely associated with the microcolony. And nocardia must not be a potent producer of uh, leukotoxins because the neutrophils generally look pretty good in nocardial effusions except those immediately adjacent to the microcolony. And nocardia, what you look for is the beaded, uh, elongated, uh, rods that I couldn't convince you there's branching here, but that's what you look for. Now, nocardia is very pleomorphic, and you can find short rods, uh, medium-sized rods uh, as well, but some of them will take the more characteristic appearance. Now, if we look at this example of uh, inflammatory effusion, we see, again, a cat, uh, cell counts low, proteins high. There's a lot of uh, difference here. And this is what you see in FIP. I've seen, I don't know what the highest I've seen. I've seen them in the eights. And the AG ratio is very low. And so a person would make the diagnosis almost just looking at this. But microscopically, it's rather characteristic because the protein tends to precipitate and you'll get a granular precipitate to the background. Now, we saw the granular precipitate in the, in the bacterial exudates, but we saw a lot of cells, and they were degenerate, where this cell is rather non-degenerate in its appearance. Another example of FIP, uh, this would be a degenerate cell, and these would be non-degenerate. They're darker, their chromatin is fairly compact and aggregated, and a darker blue in color, whereas the more degenerate cell, which is not any different than a lice cell, or one that's beginning to lice, uh, is pinker, less uh, the, the chromatin doesn't have many light areas in it, and many dark areas as well. And macrophages, lymphocytes, plasma cells may be seen. And we could even get to this degree of background in a slide from FIP. It looks like synovial fluid. And uh, neutrophils are real tight in their chromatin pattern. And we can see macrophages. All right, we've talked about the transudates. Uh, we played around with modified transudate categories, saying that there's not any difference between modified transudates and non septic exudates, uh, except the mechanism and the etiology. Sometimes we can't tell the difference cytologically. Then we've got the exudates, the septic exudates, and we may have hemorrhage into a cavity. And there are a few things that we need to say about uh, hemorrhage. Number one, acute hemorrhage or hemorrhage caused during the collection of the specimen. The blood cells will look more like those you see in peripheral blood, and you'll see platelets. But after a couple of hours, platelets are going to aggregate lice and be removed. And so, if you see platelets, uh, you know it probably happened uh, 
you probably caused it or it happened uh, in your laboratory because in a veterinary diagnostic situation, you wouldn't, at Georgia, you wouldn't get an appointment uh, uh, that quick. And so, I mean, you would have a lot of hemocytorin before you got your appointment. So we don't see, any time we see platelets, we say uh, it's probably caused by the collection. Or at least it's ongoing. Now, with time, red cells get to looking a little ragged, uh, and we may see erythrophagia. We have macrophages that look more active than the blood monocyte does, and we may go on to the point to where we can see some evidence of uh, hemocytorin. That's what we're seeing with, it, with these deposits like this. We, are, we do have erythrocytes, erythrophagia as well. Well, we'll move on, and I'll go a little faster. Somebody saw me out in the lobby and said, this is a snap. Uh, could you go a little faster? I put Dr. Cheville on earlier. <laughs> Tracheobronchial cytology is going to be more of the same, and that's the reason I got in cytology, to recognize a neutrophil and a macrophage, and say maybe it's a tumor, then you can, uh, you know, you're pretty good. Now, students tend to think that, you know, they do cerebrospinal fluid analysis, they do the transtracheal wash, they send it in, and you send back mucopurulent inflammation. Uh, they're a little disappointed. They wanted something more dramatic than that since they took the trouble to uh, do a bronchoalveolar wash or a brushing or something of that type. But you'll find out in these, when we analyze, uh, synovial fluid, cerebrospinal fluid, uh, tracheal bronchial washings there. There's a limited amount of information that we'll gain and you have to be psychologically prepared for it. Uh, I'm going to give you a diagnosis of mucopyrrole inflammation non-septic. That's, you know, that's, you get that for the price of the uh, cytology. Now you may be lucky and get something more dramatic like uh, one of these diagnoses, and I'll try to show you just a survey of the types of things you'll see. But you're seeing uh, in the literature with the other lab, I don't have experience with uh, the smaller laboratory animals, but they're being used and, and being examined with tracheal bronchial uh, valuation. The alveolar macrophage, and originally uh, these were called bronchoalveolar cells, where they turn out to be macrophages, and as you know, washing of the lungs uh, gives you a good source of macrophages. They look rather quiet, uh, usually, with a good alveolar wash. Uh, very few vacuoles, and can, look, can be rather dark staining, and may look like a cuboidal epithelial cell. And here, an example of very dark uh, alveolar macrophages. Don't have the the real characteristics of macrophage we're used to seeing in other uh, cytological preparation. Now there's mucus, of course, and mucus tends to coat cells, and with the right stain will make them appear overstained. You'll have some boiled eggs, as I call them, that you're not able to tell what it was. Neutrophils may look like that. So you do have problems when you're examining cytological preps from uh, specimens that have mucus in that it's very tough to have them flatten out, and the right stain will tend to overstain them. Now the alveolar macrophages may become more active as they are here from this case from a horse. And we can see some fungal spores that have been phagocytized and they're a little more typical of macrophages. And in the, this case from uh, chronic congestion and some hemorrhage in the lung, we see uh, hemocytorin, uh, the more aqua staining uh, material. So the macrophage uh, may be the site of the infectious agent. It may give us some idea of hemorrhage, uh, and it also tells us whether we've got a good deep wash. But they are, they are present. The macrophage is the predominant cell in a normal wash. We will get varying numbers of epithelial cells, and uh, this is from a horse. The goblet cells of the horse are very characteristic. They're not quite this dramatic in other species. Uh, we may see the cilia, or at least we'll see the columnar cells, and they'll tend to pull away from the basement membrane and have a tail at, the, at this end, and uh, we can see the more apical portion is rather characteristic. I don't have a good slide to show you, but epithelial cells can, of course, be uh, 
more cuboidal, where they'd say maybe cut off at about this distance and maybe ciliated or non ciliated. The cuboidal types don't desquamate as easily. Probably most, and you tend to, of course, get more epithelial cells with the brushings, where you're actually uh, scraping away epithelium than you do with the washes. The washes probably would get tracheal epithelial cells but just from trauma of the catheter or the uh, tube that we use to collect the wash. Now, we've talked about mucus, and mucus gets more granular if we, if we have a lot of neutrophilic enzymatic actions. And mucus can appear stringy, but you have to be careful. DNA, when you make the smear, and you notice here are nice non-degenerate appearing neutrophils, and this one's degenerate looking, uh, these will break and will get nucleic acid streaming out. There are uh, supposed to be some bacteria here. I don't know as I pick them out. Uh, if I see bacteria, then I've got a septic inflammation. The cl clinician is a little more happy with uh, his uh, wash. If we don't see it, I just call a mucopurulent, and that may be normal. Uh, we see bacteria in neutrophils, and I don't know there's anything great about them being in the neutrophil, although that probably uh, assures you that they're probably significant, whereas if they're extracellular, they could be contaminants. Although, as you're aware, if you submit cytological preps to the lab as a liquid, there can be phagocytosis in the tube. And so I, I, I don't know whether that's a valid, completely valid assumption. Uh, we don't use the term degenerative and non-degenerative as much in synovial fluids and tracheal bronchial washes because the mucus tends to stabilize the cells and they don't uh, take on the degenerate look, even though they are caused by bacterial uh, disease. As I mentioned, that the degenerate appearance may be somewhat of an artifact of preparation, and if we stabilize it with the mucus, it doesn't occur as readily. And again, uh, these, are, these are extracellular rods with some capsule appearance. You can't appreciate this where there's mucus. Now, the horse and the ruminants tend to take on a lot of uh, extraneous spores, either fungal or plant. And this may indicate that there is some compromise of the bronchociliary tree, but we see it very frequently in uh, animals housed in the barn environment, uh, they, these greenish organisms. So when they appear greenish, they probably are saprophytic. And this is a little poor picture, but this is a green hyphae. It would have looked that way. And they will be phagocytized. So it's, a, it's an in vitro phenomenon, and it may indicate some uh, compromise. Uh, Blastomyces uh, is a, in our area, is a fungus disease we can pick up by washing. One thing you have to realize about the examination of the cells lining the tracheobronchial system is that the lesion has to be communicating with an open bronchus or the wash will not get to it. For that reason, we don't see many tumor cells in washes because the tumors, probably the metastatic tumors, are interstitial uh, in their pattern, they reach the lungs by the bloodstream, and they're probably not communicating with an intact bronchus, even though radiologically they're suspected. The same can go with the inflammations. If, if we don't have a, if we're not, we can't wash the material, uh, then we'll not get the agent. So we can have some lungs that radiologically look uh, granulomatous, but we're not able to pick up the agent. This is sort of a show and tell. Uh, give you an idea of how different agents look on cytologic preps. This is an aspergillus. We can see the septi, and we can see uh, branching. They don't stain real well, and sometimes you'll only see the ghost of the hyphae, and you'll need to resort to one of the fungal stains to, to make a diagnosis. So we routinely do fungal stains on corneal scrapings from ultrad, uh, ulceration of the cornea in the horse where they're looking for a mycotic uh, invader because often we'll, we'll get this type of staining of the hyphae. We don't really get the blue. The mucus probably shields it. This was an interesting case. Uh, uh, 
you always like this on your seminars when you got parasitologists uh, present, and uh, I always have fun with parasitologists. Uh, students think I don't like them, but I, I do. I just wouldn't want my daughter marrying a parasitologist. <laughs> but what you throw this on there for the parasitologist so they'll keep coming to seminar. And we got Capillaria Orophila from a tracheobronchial wash, but he got all excited about it and told us everything, but he forgot the blasto that was also uh, present. And a Lurostrondulus, uh, we can wash up larvae of Lurostrondulus or some of the other lungworms of domestic animals. Helps us with etiology. And probably with a diagnosis that's most helpful would be that of one of the eosinophilic diseases, uh, whether it be parasitic or whether it be the eosinophilic granuloma type diseases of the lung. But the, this uh, case from the cat, the rod-shaped granules, very evident, and uh, a dog, uh, a little more rounder type granules. This, this is very easy. Uh, he'll break up eosinophils as well as mast cells and washes and you may see a disbursement of the granules and even the granules that are in goblet cells may cause you some differentiating problem. But we have probably both mast cell granules and I think there's probably some eosinophilic granules here. An another finding and seen in some of the obstructive lung disease or disease where there are, are bronchial or plugs, this is a Kirschman spiral That'd be a good ACVP test for the clean path people to find this. This is an inspissated mucus is what it is and probably comes from bronchioles, although some have said that it's, it's results, it forms uh, down in the alveoli in the pores of Kahn region. And again, uh, this is our bad looking cells. Uh, they're not supposed to get this bizarre type of epithelium in, in the lung and we see prominent nucleolus. This is a bronchoalveolar carcinoma that we're able to wash up some cells. And uh, plant fibers may be seen, aspiration. Uh, aspiration pneumonia is usually loaded with bacteria. This one hasn't gotten to that stage and maybe it was actually an artifact. I'm not sure. Uh, and another thing uh, that you'll see in tracheobronchial washings that you should not see and this is Simon Sonella, one step for mankind, I call it. Uh, some of you see what I'm talking about. It looks like a boot print to me. These are saprophytic oral organisms, and this is the squamous cell, and they tend to adhere to the squamous cell. And there are indications to us that there's oral contamination of some sort. So that's tracheobronchial washes. Uh, lymphocytes might be seen. In fact, there was a paper at the last ACVP said lymphocytes were very prominent in equine tracheobronchial washes. I have not seen that. Uh, I see them occasionally. They're not the type of cell you expect to be in a lumen of a bronchus. So there's, there's not a lot of... You may see in tracheobronchial washes, you may get a characteristic type of inflammatory cell. Uh, you may see the agent... Uh, involved and occasionally you'll see tumors. Okay, the skin. That, uh, first thing you're after in examining the cytology of the skin is, is it inflammation, is it not, uh, or is it neoplastic? And we can put, we should be able to put things fairly quickly in those categories and I'll show you some of the things we can do with the skin. Uh, Inflammatory lesions, we can characterize them by the uh, inflammatory cell. And again, our friend, the degenerate neutrophil, and we see some diplococcal organisms. Uh, you've seen enough pus today. Now, we may see some agents, and anybody know what these are? This is spore trichum. This is a cat. Or trichosis, uh, they look a little like toxoplasma, maybe a little bigger. And the cat uh, spore trichum, I haven't had an actual case. This Dr. Schmidt at Missouri, I think, put this on one of our seminars. The cat tends to get large numbers of organisms. As you know, the dog, the lesion, skin lesion is very sparse, very difficult to, to uh, see organisms. 
Uh, it's neutrophilic with uh, MAC, it's sort of a power granulomatous type response. This is uh, Cryptococcus. Now, Cryptococcus will, uh, I haven't studied the morphological aspects of the organism that much, but I do know we see the large forms that have a rather hyaline looking material. And then if you look internal to that, you'll see a sort of a crescent, not really a crescent, but a elongate structure with a nucleoid. Example here, the smaller form. So we'll see it like this. Uh, uh, most of these pictures the same uh, magnification. This is erythrocyte for size reference. And uh, or we see this type, which is not as looks like a different organism, but still have a little bit of a clearing around the organism, uh, football shape, this being Cryptococcus. Again, uh, purulent uh, primarily when there is reaction, as you know, uh, cytologically, just like histologically, we have, may have nothing but a bunch of or, uh, organisms and a sort of a soap bubble appearance, or if there's enough immunity developed, we may have some pyogranulomatous reaction. Just threw this in because I had a picture of it. Uh, this is a uh, cow. Uh, we've taken a scab off the skin, a very crusty skin lesion, made an imprint. We've got squamous, superficial, quantified squamous epithelium, and then these chains of railroad track appearing uh, dermatophilus. This is from blastomycosis, except there's not an organism there. I use this to try to show you what epithelioid cells look cytologically, and it's a little bit of a tough call, and you can appreciate, I think, more what, where they got the term epithelioid from. Uh, not in this slide, but probably the next one. These, this looks like a macrophage, but uh, this one's bluer, and this giant cell has multinucleation, and it's rather uh, blue. And, of course, we have non-degenerate neutrophils. Now, the next slide is a, looks like a tumor cluster. Uh, but the cells, if you, if you look at them closely, they're individualized. There is purulent, or at least neutrophils. They have very blue cytoplasm, and they're not extremely vacuole. And these are epithelioid cells, and this is a, this case we didn't have to cause a lot of skin lesions. As you know, you'll have a granulomatous dermatitis, but not be able to demonstrate uh, an agent uh, or a, a, an etiology, but uh, they have they have the big nuclei and the, the bluer cytoplasm and can appear to aggregate. This uh, cells are somewhat broken on this imprint. Uh, they look like macrophages, and the key to the diagnosis is this cell. You'll notice these profiles, the non-staining rod-like profiles. This is the way the acid fast bacilli look in cytological preparations. They don't take the stain. You'll have to do the acid fast stain to uh, bring them out. This was a feline leprosy case. And again, this macrophage, you can see the rod-shaped, uh, unstained, ghost-like profile. So we have inflammation in the skin. Uh, and we may see a variety of agents. Now, there are a group of non-inflammatory, non-neoplastic lesions, and uh, I'll show you some of these that, that may occur. And some of them are rather characteristic cytologically. Others, you certainly need a very adequate history to make the diagnosis. Now, the epidermal cyst uh, is characterized by cornified, superficial, anucleated uh, epithelial cells, and they look like basophilic trash. You may see, you see a lot of debris, and you may see some crystals. I'll show you a higher magnification. Now, this is cholesterol crystal. It's sort of a squash rectangle with a notch removed, and these are remnants of squamous epithelium and some lipid debris, a lot of debris around. If you see this, uh, the diagnosis I usually put down is epidermal cyst or benign keratin-producing tumor. Uh, usually, you'll not see anything but the squamous cells. And so it's probably, and if you get a lot of it on, on the cytological prep, that is probably an epidermal cyst. But I don't think, I think you get the same thing in the uh, 
in the trichoepitheliomas, the pilomatrixomas, the intracutaneous cornifying epitheliomas, that group of uh, follicle or adnexial related tumors. It's usually a cheesy material. The history is, if you get history, is very important. Now, the sebaceous hyperplasias are sebaceous adenomas, and that may be a mute point. They are a fairly big cell, vacuolated. Uh, we may get a few more basophilic cells in the aspirate. Higher mag, uh, uh, this is how they appear. And this, I would call this sebaceous hyperplasia, possible adenoma. Common, uh, real characteristic aspirate is from salivary cysts. They have a mucus uh, material in the background, and these foamy cells with uh, very bright pink uh, granules and particles in them. Uh, we argue on what the cells are, whether they're macrophages, it's, it's fact that have phagostized mucus, or whether they're actually secretory epithelial cells. If you look at a salivary cyst histologically, it's usually lined by a macrophage type cell, and I feel like these are probably macrophages, although you can get an aspirate of a salivary gland and look at the epithelial cells that look some, they're very vacuolated as well. Uh, lipomas are adipose tissue, you can't tell them apart. Uh, fat cells, uh, this is low mag, this is how a cluster of fat cells look and a higher magnification. You may see a little nucleus, you may have some free lipid, and then this is the intact cell. I don't think you can tell a lipoma from adipose tissue aspirin. Seromas are uh, a common finding, and history helps you on that, but the, what you usually see is red cells and some macrophages and cells that look like Mesothelial cells, which probably uh, may be trying to line the cavity of fluid, and it's probably a connective tissue cell taking on this uh, characteristic. And the macrophages can look uh, rather active. Okay, diaplasms. Uh, and probably that's the main reason that the, the cytology was done, is to determine whether you had tumor or whether you're looking for an agent. And we tend to break the tumors down into three groups uh, by their cytologic characteristics. And the round cell tumors are uh, probably what we do the best job cytologically because most of them are hematopoietic types of cells and they lend themselves best to uh, hematological stains and probably can be diagnosed best by looking at cytological preparations. Many years back, uh, I wrote a paper concerned, Dr. Prossi and I, concerning round cell tumors, and it, the reviewer sent it. We made the statement, the blasphemous state, statement, that this cytology could be used to confirm a histologic uh, diagnosis. And, and one of the die hard straight pathologists, uh, as, as we might call them, uh, thought that that was blasphemy, but I told him that was the reason we wrote the paper. I can say that because I'm an anatomic type as well. But the mast cells uh, in, are easy. Uh, again, the, we could train the chimpanzee. When they're very well differentiated mast cells, grade one type tumors, uh, the granules will take all the stain and you won't even stain the nuclei and even the eosinophils are not well stained. And this would be a well differentiated type of mast cell tumor. And then we get to the more undifferentiated, a type uh, grade three type mast cell tumors, and the granules are there in most cells and may be fairly prominent in some cells and almost absent in others. And those characteristics that you're used to in, in the grade three, the nuclear anisocaryosis, we've got little cells and some rather large uh, mast cells, and this cell may be aggregating its chromatin ready for division. There will be mitoses in these. So, the cytology, cytologic appearance of mast cell tumors uh, can help you in grading them. And this is a 
one we followed uh, was a faculty member's uh, dog, uh, multiple mast cell tumors that tended to regress. And we see the granular tumors, we see the eosinophils, and we see a large number of lymphocytes were in this tumor, which may have, there may have been some uh, local immunity taking place here that allowed them to regress. Because we will see lymphocytes in transmissible venereal tumors and even plasma cells in the regressing tumor. The cutaneous histiocytoma probably is the most difficult of the group because mast cell tumors, cut uh, lymphomas, plasma cytomas, that group of tumors tend to desquamate or ask us release a lot of cells on aspiration. The histiocytoma does not. You get a lot of broken nuclear fragments. But you have this type of cell. Now, it, it's got the shape of a histiocyte. Uh, it, has, it does not have the vacuolated cytoplasm, and you don't expect to see phagocytosis. Uh, and the difficulty, you, you may even have difficulty calling it neo, neoplasm if you don't get too many cells. Now here's a one group of cells that tended to cluster, and I tend to look for a clearing, characteristic I like to see is a clearing in the periphery of the cytoplasm is a character, and some scalloping appearance to the cells uh, helps me. You don't expect to see real prominent nucleoli, and again, the, the vacuoles are not a feature of the histiocytoma cell. Dr. Prosse always likes to see some nuclear folds, some evidence of nuclear fold, and this is about as good as you can get for that. It, uh, if we go back, uh, the cytoplasm is really not dark enough to be a cutaneous lymphoma, and so uh, these don't really look like lymphocytes, so that's not really a problem. And as we'll see uh, later, it's not a problem with the TVT. Probably the closest cytological call on the histiocytoma is the plasma cytoma. Now, we didn't have to worry about that several years ago. This tumor had not uh, evolved enough to, to get a good name. We called it uh, round cell tumor of the skin, reticulosarcoma, reticulum cell sarcoma, uh, so forth. But it's been shown that these are plasma cells. And again, they, they have eccentric nuclei and the cytoplasm is bluish, a little more bluish than the histiocytoma, and you'll see multinucleated cells, which tend to characterize, characterize the plasma cytoma. But it's close, very close to a cutaneous histiocytoma. Uh, this was one that we called a reticular, reticulosarcoma. It's multinucleated, uh, and when Dr. Rakic uh, went through our files, uh, she didn't tell us this. She went back and looked at all the, the lymphosarcomas, reticulum cell sarcomas, amelanotic melanomas that we had in the files and got the tissues and did immunochemical staining. And some of, one of my amelanotic melanomas turned out to be a plasma cytoma. And this one we'd call a reticulosarcoma turned out to be that. And again, uh, it's eccentric, not as blue as the previous, but we did have the multinucleated cell. Now, the cutaneous uh, lymphomas, uh, again, uh, this is a, a little bizarre looking one, more convoluted type nuclei, very blue cytoplasm, may have some Golgi zones. Uh, this one's fairly high mitotic index. Uh, mitoses, of course, I treat you like students. I tell them mitoses are for clinicians. Uh, you got a clinician down looking across the two-headed scope with you and he's not believing what you're saying. If you can show him a mitosis, he goes home happy. <laughs> they, of course, just mean uh, increased cell division. And uh, a couple of, this was a case, this was a mycosis fungoides case. Uh, these are not, it's a little bit convoluted in this nucleus. I wouldn't say these are cesare cells, but uh, showing you the variation in and lymphocytes, and lymphocytes can be vacuolated. That doesn't make the cell a macrophage. And these are more typical of what we see in lymphocytes. And you may uh, see these structures, which are cytoplasmic lymphocyte fragments or lymphoglanular bodies, as they've been called by some. 
And TVT is very characteristic, whether it's in the nose or on the vulva or on the prepuce or in a lymph node. Uh, it's a large round cell, rather distinct, uh, slightly oval nucleus. Uh, the, the key things in it are its clear cytoplasmic vacuoles. These are sharply punched out. It's not a foamy look, and they're pretty, pretty uniform in size. And you may pick up uh, a bluish nucleus. You get a blue haze here. Macrophages can be present, and uh, here's a plasma cell. This one may be starting to regress. So this cell, I feel real confident that I can pick it out. You can put it in anything, and I'll come out with a TBT cell. Okay, epithelial tumors. And uh, again, probably the, what we're trying to do is get it down to epithelial tumor. I, I feel like if I can be confident of that, I've, I've gotten probably the major part of the information I'm going to give the person. And from there on, you probably need to rely on your histology. Although the squamous cell tumors are a little bit uh, different in their appearance. Uh, this is a squamous cell uh, carcinoma. You have no real big uh, cell. It doesn't look, we know it's a tumor cell. We don't have a problem there. We may have a problem calling it squamous, but it has a lot of cytoplasm. It's not too dark in the blue. Uh, another shot of a squamous carcinoma. They can be rather anaplastic looking. These big nucleoli, some nuclear molding, a couple of big nucleoli here. This is not real difficult to say that it's malignant. Squamous cells tend to shed as individual or small groups of cells in aspirates. And another uh, squamous carcinoma that looks less maybe like a squamous carcinoma, but you shouldn't have any trouble calling it a carcinoma. You see this nucleus mold to the adjacent cell. Uh, this is a aggregate cluster of epithelial cells. They look rather tame, uh, all the same size. The nuclear pattern doesn't show any abnormalities, even though this is a right stain. This happened to be a basal cell tumor. I would write the clinician back that I think we're dealing with a uh, epithelial tumor, and it looks benign to me, and that's probably as far as I would go. I could quote him some possibilities for that area. Uh, this is an apocrine uh, gland uh, adenocarcinoma, actually. I put it on to show you that we may get tubules or acini, fra acin or fragments on an aspirin. Uh, this doesn't uh, look too bad at this power. It's pretty well differentiated. The diagnosis was made histologically. Uh, this is just a cluster of tumorous epithelial cells that happen to be a mammary adenocarcinoma. We could definitely call it tumor. We, don't, we would like to have a look at the nuclei to call it malignant. The perianal tumor is rather characteristic in that it occurs in the perianal area. That always helps to have history. Uh, and if you got that history, then you know what you're looking for. You, and if you, I don't have any hepatocytes to show you, but hepatocytes look like this, a rather small, round, slightly oval nucleus and a rather granular blue cytoplasm. There's uh, one shot. Here's a little different staining when uh, these cells are broken. The reason the cell's chromatin pattern looks so ropey is because the cells are beginning to lice. They've taken on some water and the swelling and the nucleoli look bluish. But notice the brown, blue, granular cytoplasm. And that's about as far as I go. Uh, I've had some I thought looked a little, at some atypia, and we'll mention that, but it's hard enough to call a paranal tumor malignant when you have histology, uh, and I'm not confident enough in cytology to call it. Now, we may see some product uh, in tumors of uh, skin tumors. And this, uh, I, I can't quite explain why we've got this darker scene. This was an African gland adenocarcinoma. Uh, I might have suspected something uh, 
a little more dense or a little higher in protein than a sweat gland tumor, but you may see product uh, which might help you uh, uh, in your diagnosis of neoplasms. All right, spindle cell tumors. They are going to be the type of tumor that has the least number of cells. And a well-differentiated fibroma probably is not going to yield you too many cells. This is unusual for a spindle cell tumor to get this many intact cells. Almost all the nuclei that you see here have some cytoplasm. But it's not uncommon to find aspirate from, from some of the rather tissue-bound tumors, like the fibrous connective tissue tumors, just to get uh, free nuclei that look like these nuclei. And that can happen with some of the epithelium as well. Uh, so we don't uh, you know, make too many diagnoses and may even uh, fail to recognize it's a tumor. Another problem with the spindle cell tumors is that reactive connective tissue uh, looks tumorous. Granulation, very active granulation tissue. Uh, you know histologically you can get areas of granulation tissue that'll bother you. And then you see other areas that look more typical of granulation tissue from a histologic pattern, and that gives you your confidence that you're not dealing with a fibroma or fibrosarcoma. Well, you, that problem is, is there with cytological prep. So uh, a lot of caution needs to be uh, taken. This could be a real active area of granulation tissue. These are young uh, fibroblasts probably. Another example, and, and we can have some pink uh, material between the cells uh, in fibrosarcomas. This was a fibrosarcoma, and probably it's the size of the cell and the enlarged nucleus that points uh, more to the malignancy of it. I personally have a harder time separating maybe benign from malignant in the spindle cell tumor. But the mere fact that you get a lot of cells out probably points towards malignancy because the malignant ones are more cellular, have less collagen, probably have less uh, developed fibers uh, holding it into the tissue. So you can use those facts to sway your opinion. Now, as you get more undifferentiated, uh, uh, the, these, this is another fibrosarcoma confirmed histologically. And the cells still are, they have some attenuation of the cytoplasm. They have real big nuclei. The nuclear cytoplasmic ratio is higher in these than maybe the first slide I showed you, because I took the picture for the mitoses. But this, uh, this probably looks a little less differentiated. The hemangioparasitoma has a a fairly uh, characteristic appearance cytologically. And I don't know how you are. You, you'll find, I'm, I diagnose more hemangioparasitomas now than I used to. Uh, I think we go through stages where it's fibromas and then maybe it's hemangioparasitomas. But cytology may help you there. And you'll notice that, that these uh, appear to have more processes than the the fibroma, fibrosarcoma I just showed you. And this is a, uh, another example. See, looks like a veil. And I work real hard at that. Uh, my colleague said, now don't you go up there to the AFIP and talk about those veils. Uh, and I'll, I'll try not to. My, when I was in Iowa, I worked on my southern accent, but now that I'm back in Georgia, I think it's, you know, it's probably full blown. But these, uh, these, this, these types of processes on uh, in a tumor aspirate from an uh, animal where the tumor's off the rear, on the skin of the rear leg. I always remember my mentor, Dr. Ramsey, talks about when he took the path boards and they showed the kodachrome of the dog in Smith and Jones that had the lobulated hemangioparasitoma on the rear leg. The trouble is they'd gotten the picture turned around. And he said that was the first kodachrome and that one 
they were all tense for the exam and that type of thing. And some guy spoke up, said, "You got the dog going the wrong way." <laughs> And that loosened things up, and I think probably helps some folks. But uh, we, we can, uh, we've got some characteristics that might to help us put it in that category. Uh, this uh, fuzzy looking thing is probably not all my photography, but it's, it's one of those uh, mixosarcomas that was like jelly uh, when they took the aspirin. And some of, like a lipoma, you can diagnose lipomas looking at it and see if it's got. Uh, shiny droplets before you stain it. Well, the myxomas, the myxosarcomas uh, may be mucoid enough to see grossly, or they may get this uh, appearance microscopically, and they can be very attenuated, or should be very attenuated cells, and may be more stellate like uh, this particular cell is. This is an mangiosarcoma, and it, uh, it would be tough to call it that. There are a group of connective tissue tumors that can, you know, this, this has some appearance of epithelium. It's a cluster, not very attenuated. This one may be a little bit. Uh, mangiosarcs can be very vacuolated in their cytoplasm. But there are other uh, connective fibrosarcs might uh, do that as well. So there's, I don't think I, I can uh, diagnose a mangiosarcoma just looking at the cytology alone. Now this is a chondrosarcoma, and we've got this uh, pink material, which is probably chondroid, uh, between the cells. And it may be difficult to separate it from an osteosarcoma because osteoid can stain uh, very similarly. Uh, this is a multinucleated uh, chondrocyte uh, from the same tumor. The osteosarcomas and probably other sarcomas, but more typically in the osteosarcoma, will be these uh, pink azurephilic looking granules will be in the cytoplasm of some of the cells, which is one thing I look for. Uh, they are not, not a real attenuated cell. The nucleus is usually eccentric and it has abundant cytoplasm. Uh, the, this shows the pink material between the cells, again, could be any type of collagen, whether it be collagen as we know it, or chondroid, or osteoid. Uh, again, we have the vacuolated cell, and I don't see granules real good in this picture. Another example of an osteosarc uh, with the eccentric nucleus, the abundant blue cytoplasm, and the pinkish granules. Now, I know these are not skin tumors, but I sort of threw, threw in some other sarcomas to talk about spindle cells. Now, this could be uh, an osteoclast from an osteo osteosarcoma. It happened to be from a cat, uh, and it had some macrophage and fibroblast-type cells in the aspirate, and it had a histologic diagnosis of, of a malignant fibrous histiocytoma. That's another one of those tumors that's sort of turning into a garbage can. Uh, we can get multinucleated tumor giant cells in a number of different tumors, so I don't know it's particularly specific, but we've had some cases out that we've called malignant fibrous histiocytomas that uh, the asteroid will, will have numerous uh, giant cells, and when we see the large numbers uh, without a lot of osteoblastic-like cells, we'll tend to go to this tumor, particularly if it's the history sounds like it's a soft tissue tumor. Melanomas, again, uh, may uh, be nothing but black cells. You could diagnose this one probably grossly because of the number of granules. The more malignant types, it may be a little more difficult. This is uh, a malignant melanoma, and this cell is pretty, uh, pretty obvious. But these other cells are, are more amelanotic. And uh, cytology may help you in the amelanotic melanomas because a cell with just a little bit of pigment uh, may not be as obvious uh, histologically as it is cytologically. So I, I think of, uh, of cytology of skin tumors as an adjunct to histopathology. Uh, 
uh, it, it probably in a diagnostic situation, if, if we're, for instance, have a, a call to do a frozen section, we'll imprint it before we freeze it. And probably it wouldn't uh, hurt you to, uh, any to look at uh, some of the other tumors uh, cytologically while they're being processed for histology. All right, I've got one other thing I threw in. I didn't know how long two hours would be. Uh, lymph node cytology. I, it is probably a, what I'd consider a high yield, and there's nothing in your notes about this, a high yield experience although we don't have a lot of different diagnoses, but it is probably the best way to diagnose uh, malignant lymphoma, lymphosarcoma. An enlarged lymph node is a, a signal to aspirate. And if it is enlarged, here are your diagnostic possibilities. Uh, and probably the, the lymphadenitis is not a differential problem from the other three, Hyperplasia and lymphosarcoma pose a problem. Metastatic neoplasia, uh, if you see the tumor cells, then you've got your diagnosis. If you don't, you're probably going to call it hyperplasia. Now, how do you attack a lymph node aspirate? What do lymph nodes have in them? Lymphocytes. Still, I'm advancing from my neutrophil macrophage lecture to lymph nodes have lymphocytes. And they're primarily what we call... Uh, small lymphocytes and mature lymphocytes, and this would characterize the predominant cell in a normal node and even a hyperplastic node. Now, there may be some initial problem in orienting yourself on cell size. I don't have a problem with this one because I have a couple of plasma cells that show me that their nuclei is about the same size as small lymphocyte nucleus. If you don't have the plasma cells we refer to, in the dog, the dog erythrocytes about the size of a small lymphocyte nucleus. A small lymphocyte should be smaller than neutrophils. And so once we get our orientation uh, as to size, uh, then we can speak to the predominant cell. And in, in both hyperplasia and a normal lymph node, they should be small. I don't diagnose normal nodes uh, because they're not aspirated. Enlargement's the reason you aspirate. The only time that a normal node might be aspirated is if you're looking for metastasis. And then a negative would, not, would uh, not mean anything. A positive would, but a negative might not mean anything. You'll have a certain number of larger lymphocytes uh, in, in the normal and hyperplastic node, but they should be a small percentage of the total cell population. A different stain uh, uh, showing you a larger number of plasma cells in this area, the broken nuclei, and this is a Mott cell or Russell bodies. This is how they appear uh, cytologically with the right stain. They're clear, the evacuated uh, cell. They do not take any of the stain. Uh, you'll see this type of cell, uh, which is probably a lymphoid cell, but it's in the minority. Macrophages and can be seen in lymph nodes. The reticular cell and the endothelial cells, of course, are nor in normal nodes, but they are usually not aspirated intact. And so you, you'll not see uh, those cells readily. Aspiration is rather traumatic to the cell, and lymphocytes, again, are very fragile, so we'll have a large number of lysed cells. Uh, this will show it, uh, maybe. Uh, this cell probably has no cytoplasm. We may have a lot of free nuclei. This nucleus and this nucleus probably are free. So you, you'll have to get used to that. Look at the intact cells. Don't worry about the lysosomes. Now, another, this is an aspirate from a node, uh, not too commonly seen. Uh, this, may be, these may, this may be a small lymphocyte here. Uh, these groups of cells are erythroid series, a metarubrocyte, uh, and then several rubrocytes getting back very early rubrocyte, even a, in the pro-rubrocyte category. Uh, and we've got our lysed cells again. This happened to be a myeloid metaplasia, extra medullary hematopoiesis of a lymph node. 
I guess you'd have to think that possibly erythemic myelosis uh, might be a possibility if it was a cat, but by the central pallor, this is a dog. Now, and so in our, if we have a lymph, enlarged lymph node and we aspirate and we find small lymphocytes and plasma cells, we say hyperplasia. We do not uh, call it normal. I, I would call any node that I get that, that looks normal, I'll call it hyperplasia. I remember the AFIP seminar I came to several years ago on hematopoietic neoplasia. The, uh, one of the speakers said a normal node's a reacting node. That, that's what he called a normal node. So probably reactive hyperplasia is what the node's supposed to look like. And we may see an uh, abscess node, a purulent inflammation, and that's just like inflammation anywhere else. Uh, we may have eosinophilic inflammations or hypersensitivity reactions along with signs of uh, hyperplasia. Small lymphocytes again, plasma cells, and then the inflammatory cells. Uh, we can have granulomatous lymphadenitis. We see, again, the epithelioid cell macrophage. No vacuoles, very blue type cell. Uh, and uh, the organism, blastomyces is pyogranulomatous. You'll see neutrophils, and often the neutrophils surround the organism. At low powers, you look in blasto and exudates or anything, you look for a dark structure surrounded by neutrophils. We don't see much of this disease in our area, uh, but uh, we've got small lymphocytes. We don't have much, many inflammatory cells. This happens to be a macrophage to give you an idea of what histo histoplasma looks like cytologically. Rather small organisms. You, it'll be intracellular. They'll be round. They'll not be the uh, oval to uh, the more fusiform football-shaped nucleus that we get in the it would get in toxo and they would get in the crypto and spore trichosis and the like. This slide has a, a long history. Uh, I had this case, uh, I had a graduate that went into practice and sent me this lymph node aspiration and said, Dr. Duncan, I've got this lymph node aspirate. I look in it and I think I see histoplasma. And I looked at it and I said, uh, very good. Uh, in fact, the, the veterinarian is a clinical pathologist now, very prominent. And I said, you, you did good. That's really great. You saw the organism, but it's not histoplasma. It's toxo. And uh, a couple of years later, I wanted to make an AT of lymph nodes. And I said, I'm going to get that toxo out and put in it. And I put it on the photoscope and started focusing in on my toxoplasma. And that's what you see. And, of course, you recognize it as Lishmania with the kinetoplast. And I saw this individual several years later, and then he told me the army history of the dog and all those good things that they never tell you. <laughs> I've missed that. I've missed uh, Lishmania real bad again uh, last year. I was on the biopsy service, and we, uh, we got one of those biopsies from the clinic with a typical history of dermatitis and I looked in it and I say it was granulomatous and even did a stain on it which I usually don't do uh, because it delays the diagnosis and stain for fungi and bacteria and didn't see anything and reported it out and they also biopsied the case and it had a glomerulonephritis and they somebody told them they could treat that maybe with steroids and then uh, one of the graduate students came to stick it in my ear, said, you want to see the bone marrow? Well, she didn't think she was sticking in my ear, but the animal died and was posted. Showed me the bone marrow, and the bone marrow looked like this with the Lishmania. And she told me about the case being here, and I, and I said, I wonder who the dummy was that missed this. And I went back and looked, and it was me. And they were there histologically. Well, they're very small, very small organisms. You could... <laughs> You can miss them histologically, but it's more difficult uh, cytologically to, to miss this, uh, this bug, and it, I guess it is, uh, is seen with more frequency. This would be a good one-minute path ACVP slide. 
Uh, we can see the bugs. I'd rather have this uh, second slide than that one. You ought to be able to make a diagnosis from this one. This is not a lymph node. This is a rectal scraping. And uh, you have this oval-like structure, but the clue here is when it shows endosporulation. This is prototheca, and this is how it looks uh, cytologically. We've seen it in the lymph nodes, eye, cerebrospinal fluid, but probably the best place to see prototheca a diagnosis systemic prolotheca cases with the rectal scraping, the organisms are more numerous. This slide has a story behind it. Uh, I went to the necropsy room one day and saw two parasitologists in the necropsy. And, <laughs> and I, of course, couldn't resist uh, finding out what they would be doing there other than counting uh, worms. And, <laughs> and, and they had a dog they were posting that had lymphadenopathy. And uh, I asked them, and they said they had imported a, a salmon from uh, Washington and fed this dog, and uh, they were posting it. They didn't even tell the pathologist. And we've all read that and seen the pictures. And I got some slides and imprinted the lymph nodes. And this is the, the I, I know it is Neo Rickettsia helminthica. It may have changed by now, but you see how uh, Rickettsia look on a cytological preparation. And then uh, lymphosarcoma, which is our most common diagnosis, and most lymph nodes are aspirated for that. And you're looking for a population of immature lymphocytes, big, nucleoli, dispersed chromatin, uh, bluish cytoplasm, more abundant than the small lymphocyte. And we've got our lice cells to see as well. This one uh, is a humbling experience for a clinician. They aspirate the submandibular lymph node, and, and you see this, and these are salivary epithelial cells. Uh, yesterday, I had a case where I was submitted the right and left submandibular lymph node aspirates, and I found this in both of them. As you know, that's the salivary gland is very prominent there, and you'd hope that lymph, that lymph nodes would palpate as easily. But, this is the one time, I guess, that epithelial cells might not indicate metastatic tumor if you aspirate something other than a lymph node. Other than that, if you've got a lymph node and you've got cells that are not supposed to be there, then it's easy to diagnose tumor. It's easy to, it's malignant. Uh, so that's no problem if you find cells that are not supposed to be there and, and they're big. This, uh, I don't remember the, what type of tumor we had here, but a tumor cell cluster. Uh, another example of the lymphocytes here, smaller than neutrophils, but then a cluster of cells, much more basophilic, uh, larger, uh, an adenocarcinoma metastasizing. We can have, uh, other than carcinomas, you can't have melanomas in lymph nodes. They may not be as granulated as these cells. And mast cell tumors uh, will metastasize the node, and this, this demonstrates that they can be well differentiated and metastasize. Uh, this is a case of granulocytic leukemia in a dog. Uh, even though we do see the normal small lymphocytes in plasma cells, we do see the immature a, a metamyelocyte here, band, uh, probably a progranulocyte with these granules, and it, uh, it helped us in our diagnosis. Of course, in the myelo myelogenous tumor, uh, leukemias, the cells will be in the sinusoids, and they'll be there to visualize when you aspirate, and may help you out in a diagnosis, but, and the nose can be uh, somewhat enlarged. So that's... Uh, what I have for you, and I'll uh, got five minutes to entertain any questions. Yes. What kind of markers did you use for the of the I think primarily IgG, and and it may have had uh, it may have initially used a maybe a polyclonal globulin, but it did use IgG. Do you think some of these 